Um, you know, as a leadership group, I think, uh, and, and a leader, my belief is you have, to, you have to think kind of audaciously when you strategic plan, right? So there's always the danger when you sit down and, and create a strategic plan that you're doing too much, right? That you're doing too much. And we had six initiatives that we put on the table um, a, a couple of years ago, all of which we thought spoke to leadership and to innovation and to redefining preparation, building kids of integrity. But there was a concern we were trying to do too much, at least I did. But you know, when you throw those initiatives at the wall, you don't know which ones are going to stick, right? Or to use another metaphor, when you plant those seeds, you don't know which ones are going to bloom and which ones are just not going to get enough water or soil nutrient, and they're going to fade away. So if you only pick two initiatives, right, and one fails, you don't have all that audacious a plan, right? So my concept is throw six and see what happens. Now, to my uh, previous narrative, the reality of this community and their ability to link arms and to have people step forward and be given responsibility and autonomy to develop a program and to innovate and to be agile and say, we'll do this, my instinct on that has proven true. So what's happened is we have six that are moving, and I wouldn't have anticipated that, right? And I say that now at this point because of all of the ones that we cast, this was one that I probably underestimated most vividly in terms of how far it would move and how quickly it would move. And that's all our initiatives in the area of STEM. Now, STEM uh, is, is simply a parlance for saying that we will teach science and technology, engineering and math, not as isolated disciplines, but as integrated functions, right? Because in science, we use data from math, right? And, and science has numerics all over it. And those should be integrated and taught as a whole. Nature is beautiful, and it's engineered, and it's constructed, and it's designed, right? And, and, and so that's a piece of that whole puzzle. And then technology in these days is ubiquitous. It's the backbone for all of our research and analysis and study. So how can you begin to interweave those in ways that have create that engaging, enervating uh, experience for learners, right? And so I told you last year, I said, you know, we're going we're gonna to put in some middle school electives in STEM. We're going to turn 3-4 from teaching science and math to teaching it as a, as a whole. We're going to build some local partnerships that continue to um, allow us to develop our co-curricular robotics experience. And then we're going to do some things inside, under the hood, if you will, to make sure that our, our technology infrastructure enables the type of computing that we're going to need to support all of this. Right? And again, the success has been you know, really tremendous. Another picture really selected for purpose. Right? These are some of our <clears throat> sixth grade kids. And you, you can see by the, the way that they've uh, set their team where one of their off-campus passions is, which is in sports, specifically football jerseys. And you know, this speaks to me a lot about where Parrish is as a brand. Right? Because when I arrived two years ago, eight months, right, I came in as the uh, head of school who'd coached football for 20 years. That was, sort of my, that was sort of my tag. That was my brand. And so a lot of the, a lot of the concern was, oh, here comes the football coach to lead the football school. Because right? Parrish had been really successful really quickly in football. Now, I'm unapologetic about our 12 state championships. Right? And we're going to win more. And I'm as supportive of, of our success athletically as anyone. But we will not be exclusively branded as Parish as an athletic school. Right? And these kids give so, um, such vivid purpose to that. Right? These are all kids that love their athletics. Multiple sport athletes behind us there. Love their football. But they found in their robotics an ability also to demonstrate the fact that they can compete in competitions of the mind. Right? And they can collaborate and have teamwork in space that's not just on the gridiron or the basketball court or the lacrosse field. And what Parrish has done very quickly is said, we're not going to have pockets of excellence in this area. Right? So yeah, we went out to first in the fall, and our upper school team came in third and beat Hockaday and beat St. Mark's, beat Jesuit. Right? And that's fine. But then we go and we have three teams at the regional finals for our middle school. And no other school, including our independent school brethren, were represented in that depth there. So very quickly, what we've established is that we don't just have a team at one level. We have good, developing, strong, vibrant program now moving across all three of our divisions. I couldn't have told you we'd been there last year, and I'm excited that we're there. And there are reasons that we're there, but it's happened very quickly. And that's, all, that's differentiated us and delineated us, I think, in good measure uh, in very short order. Now, the first piece of STEM that you have to be looking at is this whole concept of techno technological infrastructure. And our Chief Technology Officer uh, Paul Tidmore and his crew have done a great job in 18 months essentially expanding our bandwidth. So you can be wireless almost anywhere on campus at this point. Okay? And we sent out a letter to our 7th through 12th grade families in December and said, your students can now bring their device to school. It's a model in education parlance, and that's called bring your own device. For a long time, schools that wanted to get into one-to-one -one 
had to be the third middle person in the computing exchange. So I had to, as a school, buy the computers and either charge you tuition or lease them to you, right? And that put all sorts of onus on us from a budgetary standpoint and responsibly for maintenance and becoming a leasee or a leaseor in this case and monitoring those relationships. And what schools have found is that the technology is changing so quickly and most of our families, quite fortunately, already have these types of devices at home for kids that the schools don't need to play in that space. The schools need to be Starbucks, right? We need to create the model that when your child shows up with technology, or you show up with technology, you go sit down out there in a the great hall, you can get on, right? So what's happened in the last uh, you know, two months in particular is in, those, in the tower, you're seeing more of our upper school kids bringing their device, right? And we have PCs and we have Macs, probably more of the latter, quite honestly, if you walk around the upper school. But they can use both here and they can use both effectively. Now that's only one piece of the equation for us. Because what has to happen, similar to what we talked about with the digital profile and the practices of the, uh, in, 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 in that capacity, is we have to help our faculty learn how to leverage these tools, right? Because these tools can just be glorified electronic notebooks if we allow them to be. I mean, students just taking notes on them, they're still consuming, right? They're not producing anything with them, right? It's not creating that engaged learning environment if the teacher's still talking for 60 minutes and the students are just staring into this. Or if they're just going and getting information from the web, and not doing anything with it. So how do you turn these devices from consumptive devices to productive devices? So here's an example from an upper school class. Happens to be mine, since I could film it really quickly. So I selected this because it's not the most revolutionary lesson design in the world. We're reading a chapter out of a packet, right? But what you're seeing there is you're seeing some of the kids using the PCs the schools provided, right, here. And then you got Eliana who's using her Mac. And in an old school lesson, I might have given chapter two to my class and said, you know, read it or take 10 minutes, sit there quietly and read it, and then we're going to talk about it, right? And when we talked about it, kids might have taken notes, the most, enter uh, the most uh, engaged of them in their notebook and been real studious, the girls mostly, right? <laughs> and the others would have just sort of sat there and listened perhaps. Or maybe in old school I'd have gone to my chalkboard and written up the keynotes from that chapter, right? But now we can turn it from being sort of a consumptive experience to a productive experience because they have section one of chapter two, they have section two of chapter two, they have section three of chapter two, they have section four of chapter two. They are going to Google Docs and putting the most salient or relevant information from section one onto the Google Doc. Simultaneously, group two is going to that same Google Doc, and they are writing their iterative notes of the most salient points from section two of chapter two, and so on through the four different groups. At the end of that now, rather than me giving the notes, the students have collaboratively thought critically about that section of reading, what's salient here, what's not, and why, and they put it to the Google Doc. So the class has constructed the notes, right? I'm just filming it with my phone. You know, I'm, not, I'm not shepherding that in any way. And then as a class, we can talk about what's on the Google Notes together, and each pod can act as the expert for their section of that particular chapter. So we have work to do with faculty, which we will, to support them in figuring out how to take these devices, especially in middle and upper school, and turn them into real powerful changers of how we teach and learn. Then, of course, there's the whole integration of STEM into our core program. So our science faculty from K to 8 has been doing amazing work in the last 18 months, essentially tipping the way we teach science, right? So in some forms and fashions, in third and fourth, for example, they have the STEM block. And science and math are taught as an integrated whole, right? In grades 1 and 2 and 5 through 8, what you're seeing is more focus on inquiry more focus on the integration of math into science. And this year, our middle school faculty, under no direct pressure from me or Marvin McHugh in the science chair, just said, we're going to integrate a STEM unit. They made that commitment. And you see vivid examples of it as you walk up and down the hallway, right? So you see the sea urchin, and you see the jellyfish, and you see the dragonfly, and you might think, well, that's a terrific art project, right? And my whole piece to parents on the education side of STEM is, don't get stuck or lost on the product because the product is misleading, right? That is, effect, in effect, the design or engineering component of the STEM work. 
but the back work behind that. You know, have Margaret or Emma Heap sit down and show you the wiki that they have behind that, which shows the mathematics that they have from doing either research or lab work tied into the science concepts on a blog, right? To show the science and the math that is backlit behind then what is a collaborative design project of something to scale that then you see outside, right? Look at the second grade roller coasters as you go out today, right? They look like an art project gone bad, right? The toilet, the toilet rolls and the duct tape. You say, what is happening here, right? But if the books are still out there, look through the book. Because the book is what tells you the story. On the first page, one student said, this is what I'd like my roller coaster to do. On the second page, the group of students who are working together said, this is what we'd like our roller coaster to do. And then collectively, they took it from sketch design to final product. And then you'll see listed on their roller coasters the vocabulary words that are the science words that back in yesteryear, they might have just done on a worksheet, right? They'd have just memorized, right? So if you look only at the final product and you try to judge it on some sort of artistic criterion or wonder what's happening to it, you'll get a little misled. And increasingly, what we want to do is bring that work back to school. So especially with things like invention convention, which I've just lived through, right? The more of that that's done here, the better. So that it's not tapping out dad's critical thinking process, right? Right? Because in this case, it's not very strong. So we want to bring it back to school. So what you see happening on campus is senior Eagle Scout individual organizes the building and design materials for the golf course. And then dads and kids come in and finish the product. And you'll see these outside too, again with the science terms of force, and et cetera, all in, uh, interwoven into this very project. Next year, the middle school will have more units STEM integrated. We have problem solving, engineering, and the Parish Inc. elective built into middle school too for kids to experience STEM in day. And then there's a robotics pipeline already referenced. This, the the, the, the uh, lettering here is probably too small for you even to read because there's been so much growth here. 230% growth in middle school. After school through our extend program, our little biddies are getting exposure to robotics through first Lego. The upper school team has grown and is now using our 1,200 square foot robotics lab upstairs, right? And then the success is already referenced in terms of the regional championship and the best competition for our oldest kids. The fact that we're partnering with the Museum of Nature and Science and with UTD and with SMU to host competitions here, to make Parrish's name a player in this particular area. And you know, <clears throat> we're agile as a school. We talk about being emboldened by our past but not burdened by it. And this is one classic example of it. On one of my first days in the office two years ago, Connor Mahoney walked in and said, I need a computer for robotics. And I said, Connor, we have computer labs all over school. Go use one of those. No, we need a computer for robotics. And it was Connor and Will Stewart who's pictured here, the tall blonde guy in the middle. They, they were sophomores at that time, but they were pushing the school into this space because of where their passions and interests were. And the school and the parents responded. That's what got us the robotics lab. And that's what's enabled these senior leaders to pull along kids like Alan with the crazy face who's a freshman, Sabine who's a sophomore, Matt who's a junior, to pull these kids along and to have our seniors by this time of their senior year doing some really extensive and impressive work. So that's a 120 pound bot, right? And as I tell folks, look, they didn't go get that at Lowe's. They designed every element of that, from the wheels 
to the 120 pound chassis, which will now shoot basketballs, because that's what it has to do for the competition. I'm not lying. It actually has to toss basketballs, right? And they have programmed all of that. So Kate's going to Davidson. You know, Connor's going to go, uh, Con uh, Cameron Pipes is in there. He's going to go study engineering, private UT. You know, these, these kids are doing all that on their own, right? And they are having authentic problem solving, critical thinking, collaborative efforts at play. They are working right next to our FRC, our FTC kids who are basically our JV team, right? Who have smaller bots in the cage. And then one cage over, Jen Makins, who we pulled out of class to direct our robotics from grades three through eight, has all the biddies working on their first Lego bots. So there are these points of exposure and inspiration now moving across the range from our kids. And next year with the Hillcrest STEM Center in Building D, what we'll have is a launch point for our kids to move from Hillcrest into this rich environment at Midway where this notion of being a smart kid, but a balanced kid who likes to go and play games after school on the football or baseball field is all part of being at Parish, right? And that's really where we're heading in this area.